Uh, I sure can. You're you're loud. You're ready clear. to go. You're good to go. Okay. Hello, everyone. My co-author and Chris Zahm and I, we want to present some of our research on the Austin chalk trend in the Gulf of Mexico. This is something we've been working on over the last four to five years. And the title of the talk or the topic will be, it's a complete geologic overview and char characterization of the upper Cretaceous Austin chalk trend along the Gulf of Mexico. And but before I get into the talk itself, I just want to say one slide of what is the group that I work in, a group that's doing this Austin chalk uh, research. We are our CRL group. It's a university industrial associate research group. That's where the university allows us to bring in sponsors. They give us a fee each year or a membership each year, and we do research and report it to them. And our RCRL group was established in 1987, so we've been going for quite a few years. We do rock-based carbonate research, and we strongly emphasize the rock base, cores and outcrops. That's the thing I think we're well known for. And broad spectrum of research, all the way from pore networks, lithophages, depth systems, reservoir characterization, sequence stratigraphy, up into the seismic base things, and also in the last year, we started in geomodeling. And we have developed concepts for exploration and production worldwide. And investigating the Austin Shaw trend is one of our major research efforts at the moment. Okay, we're looking at the Austin Chalk trend because as you all know, it's a hot trend. And it's an interesting trend because it's had several lives already. It started out back in, a, or let me first say the USGS gives an assessment estimate of 6.9 billion barrels of oil and 41.5 trillion cubic feet of gas. But it started out in the early 70s and it was first just drilling, trying to intersect fractures. It was basically fracture production. Then we started on horizontals and that was the life between about 1990 to 2015. And here, we did do horizontals that connect as many fractures as possible, but also recognizing we can get um, hydrocarbons out of some of the pore networks. And I'll talk a lot about that near the end of the talk. And then the most recent part is the fract horizontals. Here they're going into some of the tighter parts of the rock, fracking and getting material out of the fractures and also the pore networks. So the significance and overview of this presentation the Austin chalk is an active exploration trend in the GOM, but until recently, it lacked published geologic characterizations except for fractures. And then much of what has been published on the Austin chalk is from the outcrops or the updip part. And this is sort of misleading because these are not the lithophages that are producing in the Austin chalk. You really got to most of the time get down into the trend itself and look at cores. And one of the important things that I'll show you today is we have established basic lithophages that can be recognized throughout the chalk trend. That's all the way from the Mexican border up into uh, central Louisiana. And these are the building blocks of the Austin chalk to understand it. And so what I wanna present today is lithophages distribution, information on the mineralogy range and variation, um, talk about organic matter characterization, source rock potential, and present pore types, pore networks, and I think reservoir quality. That turned out, it's turning out to be one of the more interesting aspects of the Austin, is how do you approach that? And I'll, I'll give you one, my slide on what I think about self-sourcing evaluation in the Austin. Remember, there's a lot, a lot of controversy. Is it Eagleford oil or Austin oil? Well, it's both correct. And I want to just say this, the Austin Chalk Group is a complex set of rocks. I approached the Austin Chalk initially thinking this is chalk, they should be simple, but I found out the facies are quite var variable and um, there's a lot of questions that still need a lot of discussion and arguing. Okay, to do a regional study, which I say is from here to the Texas-Mexico border to where we got data over here in Central, um, Central Louisiana, 
you need, you need a large amount of rock data and associated analyses. And I'll point to some more of that out in a minute. If we collect it, like here we're showing something like 30 to 40 wells. And then we're also hitting some of the outcrops to do more of the fracture analysis. But we've assembled a large volume of data into an interactive database that we can use. And I, this is an important statement too that I like. We have collected enough analysis now to be confident of the range of parameters we are investigating or presenting. And this is our uh, a little bit of an overview of our Austin Chalk Regional Database. We got, at the time I put this slide together, we had 37 cores that we're working on or have already finished. Um, we've analyzed five outcrops and we have about over 2,200 uh, photographs of all these rocks. We looked at over 1,500 thin sections with numerous photomicrographs. And this is very important right here. We've done a lot of SEM analysis. You cannot look at the Austin shock without hitting it at the SEM. If you look at only thin sections and cores, you're missing the major component and you're missing the pore network. So we have done what they call ion mill SEM samples. Each one of these takes a day of milling to get a sample. We did 79 of these, got almost 2,000 SEM images. We've collected over 900 XRD analyses across the whole trend, over 700 rock eval and hawk organic matter analyses. And proxy and permeability data, that's an ongoing effort now, which we're trying to improve our work. We have 17 cores with analyses, with over 1,400 analyses. And out of these, and I'll show you this at the end. 33 of these are of a new method, a mod modified gas expansion analysis. This is the type of analysis you got to do to recognize what is the reservoir quality of the Austin. We have 19 wells with XRF data, four wells, complete section of isotopes. And we have a lot of uncombined rock strength analysis. Um, and it's interesting, like I worked for ARCO and I never had a data set this good when I was working for them, I calculate out this thing is worth about $2 million. That's something that I don't get here at the Bureau too often. Okay, first a general introduction to the Austin Chalk Group. This is a map from Blakely. Here we are, down, um, you had a two, two land masses here. Here's a, oh, ancestral Gulf of Mexico. Notice the Florida Peninsula here is drowned at the time. So is Yucatan, so it's pretty open open marine. Here is the Austin Shock trend going through here. Um, Western interior seaways up here with the Niobrara. So it's Niobrara up here, Austin Shock down here. And this lysoclastic rich Austin Shock limestone was deposited on a deeper water open marine drowned shelf. And the producing trend is on the outer shelf deposited or in the outer shelf deposited strata. So when I say the outcrops, which are generally the more shallower water, Austin, and I say shallower, it's still fairly deep, but it's more up dip. This is not typical, the outcrops, most of the outcrops are not typical of what you see in the cores that are producing. So it's important to get into all the subsurface cores that we have done. And an important concept too, is the bottom condition cycle between oxic and oxic. This led to a lot of source rock material in these rocks. And people a lot of times ask, what is the depth of water in the area we're dealing with. It's very hard to do, but we can talk about storm wave base during Austin Chalk time. That's beneath, the Austin Chalk is deposited beneath storm wave base, which meant none of the surface waves were affecting the bottom. And how deep is that? Well, today in this area over here, it's about 300 feet water depth, the storm wave base. And because this is now an open area, was, I mean, excuse me, in Austin time, an open area that's probably 300 feet or greater is the water depth of the Austin. It is not within wave base. And the strat section in general paleogeography, here's a stratigraphic column. The Austin chalk is from Codiacean, San Antonian into the lower part of the Campanian. That's about 9 million years. And that's got quite a bit of time. That could be about nine third order sequences. And then the, here's the regional, Paleogeographic map. There's the old Paleo Stewart, Stewart City trend. This was now buried at the time. But topography had a lot of effect on the Austin, especially controlling 
thicknesses and controlling some of the more organic rich species, such as the Maverick Basin down here. You got up to 1,200 feet of um, Austin in this area over here, going over San Marcos Arch, it thins quite a bit. So core I'll show you is 100 feet. Then these other basins and uplifts also had an effect. Like the Sabine also acted like the um, uh, San Marcos Arch or shallower water here then deepened off in this direction. And these triangles down here, these are all volcanic plugs that penetrate the Austin. Some of these were active during the upper Austin part. And I'll come back to this a few times. Okay, how is the chalk deposit. Here's our carbonate factory model. This is the shallow water area here. Um, we were not in this area at all. This, there was this, wherever this existed during Austin time, I've not seen it. Um, we're out here in the deeper water, but during the time the carbonate factory was in the water column and it was controlled by uh, uh, oceanic conditions such as chemistry and light. So two of the major components making up the chalk of the major one were coccolithospheres. These are algae. And here's one right here. Notice the uh, five micron scale size on this. But these coccolithospheres, they existed anywhere from near, right near the surface down to several hundred feet of water depth. Again, they're dependent upon light. And when these settle to the bottom, they get digested by animals and they end up breaking up into coccoliths like these rings here, or coccolith elements, the small little pieces in here. Notice again, 10 microns here. Another common thing you see are the planktic foraminifera. Again, these floated, they're pelagic, they floated in the surface here and they can occur down to several hundred feet of water depth. And they had symbiotic algae in their gut, so they needed light also. So these are the two major components, but other material you see in here are other microfossils, nanofossils, siliciclastic silt, rare sand, so mainly siliciclastic silt and clay minerals. Also some units are rich in glauconite and phosphate. Here are some of the biota and notice it's all calcite, but none of it's aragonite. And that's important because it, you get no early dissolution and it gives you a much more stable framework. And um, right th here, here's the coccoliths again, and this is a shallow buried one. And you can see a lot of interparticle pores between here. Here's a global gerinus. This is a one out of the literature that's alive. It's a local pores out, it's um, low arms out here. These are the planktonic forearms in here. There's di many different types. And generally they're filled with um, calcite. This is a thin section photo. Here's another thin section photo. This is a calcisphere, another type of algae. Here's a one in 3D. And one common thing you see in the Austin Chalka, the Inosermis clams. These were big flat clams. In Austin, they got up to about a foot, at least where I'm looking at about a foot wide. In other places in Niagara, they get several feet wide. They're big and flat. They could live in dysoxic conditions because they had large gill structures and they were very flat and thin so they could float on soupier muds. So these are a common feature we see in there. Then when you get into the shallower water areas, or a little more up there, you get more, you see more oysters, and you see a few benthic forams. It's very interesting in the Austin that benthic forams are rare to non-existent in a lot of the rock, and that's because the bottom, I think bottom conditions were always stressed, even in the cleaner chalks. And here's a model. Here's a model of the Austin chalk, or a couple models, two end members here. Um, this is the oxic one where the conditions were oxic at the bottom, and this is uh, where it's disoxic, the anoxic. Because I'm going to show you the Austin was very cyclic on a very short term, you know, in, you know, um, tens of a few inches to tens of inch scale. But basically, at the surface, this was your carbonate factory. You had ammonites up here, you got the planktic forams, the coccolithospheres. You had some, I think a lot of wind blow, blown dust came out there. When you talk about the siliciclastic component, I think most of that's windblown dust because it's only uh, silt and clays. And then you probably have some hemiplastic plumes following storms. And a lot of this stuff up here then settles at the bottom by um, suspension. You had a aerobic water column. Then during the oxic times, um, 
is the well oxygenated bottom, you got a lot of bile turbation. Where it was a firm bottom, you got things like flas flasenoides. They could they could they could burrow down several feet down, and their walls could stay open. Whereas more soupy, there are more horizontal burrows, such as suphicus and a lot of planolites and chondrites type material. And then inosermis and a few echinoids and a few of the benthic forams. But during the oxic time, I mean anoxic, this area became stagnant to where nothing could live down here. And a few inosermises are washed in and stuff, but basically you had very rare to no burrows. And you could tell it was no burrowing because it's, I'll show you, it's often well laminated or commonly well laminated. And this is the environment that you got a lot more TLC. And here it's well laminated. This is gonna be your highest TLCs up to 2%. And here it's moderate TLCs around 1.5%. And this is a very important slide. This is the Austin chalk lithophages. This is based upon logging numerous cores all the way from the Mexican border over in Louisiana. And I've come out with five lithophages that I can build my stacking patterns on. Four of them are, in, these four here are in place sedimentation. This here is a debrite. This is being transported down from shell or water. And it's a really common over in South Texas as a San Marcos Arch. But let me go through this. And these lithophages are good. And try to remember one through four, and I'll keep referring back a little bit about their characteristics. But these relate very strongly to rock strength and they relate strongly to the amount of TLC. Lithophages one is the cleanest, and I'll show you some uh, XRD data on these in a few minutes. Um, but you got a lot of bioturbation going on. It's low, relatively low clay. When I say relatively low clay, I'm talking five to 20%. And TLC is low, about 0.3%, normal for um, oxic environments. The lithophages two gets much more argillaceous. It's, uh, you don't get any vertical burrows, they're all horizontal, as you can see here. And TOC is higher, it's 1% on the average. And it's a deposit under oxic to disoxic conditions. And then notice these two have a lot of bioturbation. The next two lithophages, three and four, look lam are, are laminated. Lithophages three is pretty well laminated, but it got a few horizontal burls in it. So I call it poorly laminated with some burls. This is a marley chalk to a chalky marl, and it averages about 1.5% TLC, deposited under dysaerobic to anoxic conditions. And then this one, lithophages four, is very well laminated. And you can see I know flattened dinosermis fragments here that are brought in by um, currents um, flowing down the slight slope. And this is well laminated, marley chalk to chalky marl, and it averages 2%. I guess it can get as high as a 7%. And then the debrite is material that's being washed down by debris flows uh, from the updip area. And these are very rich in glauconite, which I'll show you some thin sections in a minute. Okay, here's the regional. Well, yeah. Okay, I'll show you the regional map again because I'm going to show you. I just showed you the lithophages. I want to show you how they stack up in two different wells. The first well is a Lloyd Hurt that's down here in the pure salt field in, in the Maverick Basin. And we published this in AEPG in 219 as a type well for South Texas. And then I'll show you another well up on the San Marcos Arch, the Brett's Recto. And this is only about 100 feet thick. This one's about 450 feet thick. So I'll show you these two cores. And I realize there's a lot of data within one core, but here's the top of the Eagleford and then going into the transition zone into the Anacacho. But through this 450 foot Austin section, these divisions here are from Tom Ewing and a GCA GS paper he did down in the Pearsall field. But essentially in the bottom where you got these laminated sediments, um, you can see how cyclic they are with our lithophages too. So the lithophages, Laminated lithophages three and four interbedded with lithophages two through here. So this is cycling back between oxic and anoxic going up the section and right up into what we call the Austin Chalk Sea. And this is probably equivalent if you're into the oceanic anoxic events, 
we think this equates to one of those oceanic and oxic events through here. Then above that, it gets more oxygenated. You got mainly lithophages two and lithophages one. Remember, lithophages one is the cleaner chalk. Then here in what they call the Austin B1, it's very common in the San Marcos Arcs of South Texas that you get a lot of these debris, glauconite rich debris flows coming in. And I'll mention later, I think this related to volcanics going on during the Austin B1. Now the well on the San Marcos Arcs, it's only about a hundred feet thick. I think we're missing some of the lower section here from non-deposition. Here's the top of the Eagleford, but you can see you're only dealing with little facies one and two basically through here, and uh, which are the oxygenated facies. You don't have those good laminated facies that gives you the TLC. And here we got the debrites again, these glauconite, glauconite rich debrites. And these probably, this is a good marker for correlation between like the hurt well and this well. And then there's cycles, both short term and then larger scale cycles within the Austin. So I keep mentioning about this oxic to anoxic cycling. And as you can see here in this core here, here's litho, nicely laminated lithophases four. This is gonna be higher TLC, a couple percent. Lithophases two, where you got a lot more burls. Here's lithophases three, again, laminated, higher TLC, lithophases two. So you get these cycles going back and forth at about the scale that you're seeing here. And here is a, um, a 50 feet of core showing a cycling back between lithophases two and lithophases four. And you can see the, the uh, lithophases four, very nice by looking, these are XRF analysis, the trace, um, the, the elements can be used as proxies for different things. So like here, the calcium is a proxy for um, calcite, silica, quartz ideally, aluminum clay, but you can see the high quartz, high clay equate to lithophases four all through here. And then anoxia, the spikes of uh, phosphate, vanadium and moly, they all correlate back to these um, lithophases four. And productivity, which generally uh, copper and nickel are two good proxies for that, that usually shows higher values during anoxic times. And again, all of these spikes you see through through here correlate back to the lithophases four. So what these species are like, the short-term ones in parts of the Austin, we think they're similar to the Milankovitch cycles. These cycles have been well-documented in our rare chalk in the Western Interior Seaway and well-documented in the North Sea equivalent age chalks. But what it does, it indicates rapid changes in oceanic water chemistry. I mean, when you look at these in course, like a light switch going on and off, how quickly they can change. So parts of the also extremely cyclic. And again, these lithophases four are gonna be your TOC rich rocks. And some of the wells, like the Robert Todd over in Louisiana, 60% of the cord section is made up of these types of facies. So that's a lot of um, TOC that can contribute to self-sourcing. And then on a larger scale of uh, stacking patterns, this is over in Louisiana, this is a, a cross section of cores hung on top of the um, uh, Austin chalk here. And if we look down in here, the core goes from A over to B. But over in this area here, coming off the Sabine Arch, you're in a sh shallower water like you were in um, the San Marcos Arch going off into the Maverick Basin. And basically we only, we have dominantly lithophases one and two through here and here. So this is more oxic, to this oxic. As you go further in this direction, from here down, you get a lot more of the anoxic and disoxic facies, number threes and four. Like this, here's a Robert Todd core where about 66 or so percent of this core has good TLC rich facies. So you see larger scale patterns too. And we're in the process of taking all of our core descriptions and trying to work out more of these patterns over all the stacking patterns to see where's the best source rocks and how will this affect the rock brittleness and fracturability of these rocks over areas. Okay, mineralogy, uh, why important chemical? It affects chemical and mechanical stability. It affects core networks, brittleness, and then um, fractability. These two are almost the same diagram, but here I'm showing you all the values. There's 915 values. These 
Diagrams were published in GCA GS Journal last fall. But as you notice here, we got calcite, which 99% of the carbonate's calcite. Here we got quartz and feldspar. Here we got clay minerals. And then this is a classification of rock types I prepared for the Austin. But basically, you can see you go down here. It looks like a lot of the stuff down here is in the chalk corner, but very few of the Austin chalk rocks are pure chalk. Pure chalk means 95% or more um, carbonate. Most of them are less. But you can see, okay, you see two populations. There's this trend going like this, and you see this trend like this. And this trend here is related to the rocks over in the San Marcos Arch and the Maverick or South Texas Maverick Basin area. These are related to the, the timing of the volcanics. So over here, you can see it without the volcanics. And what I want to point out so strongly that there's a mixing trend between the calcite and the siliciclastic minerals here. And it's a pretty well controlled trend. And it doesn't matter where you are in the section or where you are going from Louisiana to the Mexican border, it falls along this trend, which means you're mixing two end components. And let me say here that calcite is predominantly um, biotic and the quartz and feldspar is always clay the very fine silt size, which again, I think that's related to being dumped in by Olean processes and not directly being brought in by deltas or anything. The closest source areas are 60 to 100 miles away from many of these rocks. So I think this is a mixing model going back and forth through here. It's important to know your mineralogy because these are going to be much more uh, better for fracking and also poor development. It gets very argillaceous, it even becomes more of a true calcareous siliciclastic mudstone. It's not even a carbonate in this area here. But the model, I think, functions like this, is um, the carbonate input is assumed to be variable and dependent upon ocean chemistry. And that's what we see with those uh, cycles are called Milankovitch cycles. The chemistry is changing very rapidly between those cycles. And that, for me, can only be related to the orbit of the Earth around the sun and and the wobble and whatnot. And I think the siliciclastic input is somewhat remaining the same. And it's so uniform over the whole area that I think it's windblown dust doing that. And other people have suggested that for the um, Eagle fur. So essentially your carbonate is varying, your siliciclastics um, stays the same and that gives you these variant proportions. And again, the, this dilution trend or mixing trend is seen in all wells from the Texas-Mexico border to Western Louisiana. And vertically, you plot any one well and it'll come out the same. And lithophaceous control on mineralogy. Here is the four of my mineral diagrams. And, excuse me. Uh, okay, yeah, this for lithophaceous one, two, three, and four. Lithophages one is the cleanest. When I say clean though, it has up to 20, 25% clay and siliciclastics in it. And the literature will say five to 10% clay minerals will really affect the, stru the structural integrity of a rock. So this is even, would be considered rich. Lithophages two is quite, quite variable. I probably could break these into two subunits, but you'd have to have TLC analysis and XRD to do that. Uh, so visually, I keep it as one facies. Lithophases three is pretty much carbonate. Remember, this is the nicely laminated one with, with a few burls, this oxic, the anoxic. And then lithophases four is, um, can be a wide range of mineralogies again, and it's laminated and it's pretty much anoxic. And a little bit about the petrography or what the mineralogy is. Here it is at the thin section scale. It's good to look at the thin section. It gives you a picture of the larger components, but um, you need to get down to the SEM level, which I'll show you in a second to see what really is making these rocks. What, what, what is their real components that um, define them? But calcite is one of the most common things. Most of it, I said, is biotic. And here are foraminiferas filled in with diagenetic calcite cement. All the inner particle pores are always filled in um, in these rocks at the depths we see them. Here is a nine fragment. They're made up of these prisms. And here's a broken one. 
the matrix in here, matrix in here is all going to be um, calculus and play, and I'll show you that with SDM in a second. Here again, we got a lot of the plaintic forams contribute calcite. Oh, and I need to mention over here one of the major sources of calcite. This is an argillaceous facies. You can see the forams are being dissolved away. The edges of them are undergoing pressure solution where they're in contact with clay. And this is a good source of calcite for start lithifying the rock. But here is a uh, coccolith matrix and fish bones and other phosphate type grains are common in the Austin. Here's, thin, here's another couple of thin sections. In this one here, a lot of this is a clay background. This is volcanic feldspar right here. It's a very fresh looking feldspar. And I only see this in the zones where we had these debris flows during the volcanic times of the Austin. And these types of quartz here, not to show you, to show you uh, here's, it's a very clear type of quartz like here and here. And often it shows chips like this elongate one right here. And I think these are volcanic quartz grains. These again are only occurring where we have like the volcanic feldspars and in the units with a glauconite. This is under cross nickels, and these are glauconite grains. And these glauconite grains do get up to sand sized grains. Over here is a non polarized one with a lot of the glauconite. All this is glauconite. This is from the B1 unit over in um, uh, the Maverick Basin area. And the glauconite is sand sized, it's coming down with the debris flows. And there's a lot of argument is this, well, the debate is this related to just precipitation on the sea floor, or are these all? altered volcanics. Volcanic rock fragments um, in the marine environment can be altered to phosphate. And it's a coincidence uh, that all the phosphates related to where the volcanics are active in the Austin. Okay, now getting down to what I call the micropetrography level. This is the SEM scale. Always look down here. These are going to be always in microns. And these are ion milled samples and the, their EDS maps where at the, on the on the SEM, we can do trace element analysis. Very, very handy thing. And the trace elements here that make up the map by colors I'll show down here. But here's one of the simpler ones. This is from lithophacies one. Remember this, the well burled chalk is mainly calcite. And all the dark dots here are pores. And all the blue through here are the coccolith fragments. You see a little bit of silt sized quartz that's red here and here. And then this is elbite silt in here and here. And I think a lot of the albite's coming from the volcanics there. Um, and it's not coming from the continents. Here it gets more complex. This is at least lithophacies three. We can see the carbonate fragments in blue. Uh, some quartz, but that's still quartz silt. These are illite grains. Um, calcite coccolith fragments all through here. Some titanium oxide. That's also a very fine size that could be wind blown in. And again, L-bite. And here, this is lithophacies four. It's very illite rich. All the yellow is potassium, which is proxy for the illite. We got very nice pyrite framboids indicating anoxic conditions. These uh, calcite grains here are ionosermous grains with intraparticle pores. Um, and then also you start seeing some kerogen in here in different places. And then here's a really complex one, some very nice laminated kerogen. I'll come back to this later. I think these are microbial maps, but you got uh, a lot of calcite in here. These chlorites, the chlorites are coming from the volcanics also. You only see them when you get a volcanic ridge bed. And then they're weathered, from, not weathered, but um, then re redeposited from the volcanic ridge beds. Pyrite, a lot of elbite. So the mineralogy of the Austin is not simple coccolis or simple calcite. It's quite variable, I hope I've shown you. Okay, and going laterally, we divided the Austin, going from Mexico over through here into six areas. And here's the plot again of our um, mineralogy diagram. You see two populations. The area down here, this one right here, this is from South Texas, San Marcos Arch, it's richer in quartz and feldspar, and that's associated again where all these red triangles are the volcanic plugs. So probably you're getting a small contribution from the volcanics. Over here in East Texas and Louisiana, the area through here, you plots um, uh, more clay rich without the uh, quartz and feldspar. 
So there's two populations, but I don't think they're variable enough to really have an effect on the rock properties. So thoughts on mineralogy, calcite's good and bad. Calcite cementation promotes rigidity, so you don't compact away all your porosity. Uh, too much calcite though, which we see in some air sections, produce a tight matrix. Quartz and feldspar are generally neutral, not enough to worry about. Clay mainly bad, but sometimes good. Lowers mechanical strength, affects pores and pore throat size or decreases them essentially, as I'll show you in a few SEMs in a minute. However, some intraparticle pores can exist within warp clay platelets. Organic matter, why important? Uh, it's hydrocarbon source material. Solid bitumen can plug pores. Organic, whoops, it's spelling here. Organic matter pores develop during thermal maturation. Okay, here's the different types of organics I'm seeing. First, these are all SEM samples. Here's a, a EDS SEM. And here's kerogen. This is probably type three algal woody kerogen right here. And it's usually the large pieces. By large, I mean 10, 20 microns. You can't really see the algal, individual algal ones too well unless they're in mass. So, so here's type three kerogen, good for contributing to gas. Here's solid bitumen and intraparticle pore space. All this is, this is a, a chamber and it's just totally filled in. Was well, actually there's, uh, Kayla and I clayed, precipitated in here first and the kerogen filled in. And that's a pyrite framboid in there. So Kayla and I pyrite precipitated, and then bitumen migrates in, and then it solidifies. Down here, this is a common, not uncommon facies and lithofacies or especially. It's type two kerogen and these are microbial mats, all these black seams. This is an SEM uh, image, it's 50 microns across. And when you look at this, what comes into a lot of people's mind right away, they're pressure solution seams, but they are not. They're actually mats. And you can tell here, because here's rip up class over here of these mats. You see it here? And these, let me go back to this part first and I'll go back and forth between these two photos. Inside of these mats, you get these little clay platelets, only clay platelets that's showing here, and they're always parallel. And you see this commonly in other um, shale for mud rock formations. It, you don't get any other type of insoluble residue whatsoever in here, such as the pyrite or the quartz silts or the albites. That this was a pressure insoluble residue pressure solution product. You should have other material in here, but it, the biggest thing showing that these are matched, you get rip-up class of them. Here's a couple rip-up class. Now, if these were solution seams, they would form at a thousand or more feet of burial. And that means they would never be at the sea floor to be ripped up again. So these things are being ripped up while this is at the sea floor, so they end up as, as being algal mass. I find that a very interesting feature in these rocks. Okay, source rock quality. quality. Here's a couple diagrams. This is a plot of S1, S2 versus TOC, total organic carbon. S1 is the amount of hydrocarbons generated. S2 is the potential to generate more. So this is source rock quality. This is amount of um, source rock. And this is based on rock, rock Bell or Hawk data. But you can see a lot of the material in here is fair to excellent source rock, a lot of it. Over here is a, what they call a pseudo Van Kevlin diagram, hydrogen index against oxygen. And here you plot the type of kerogen you have. And you can see that a lot of the kerogen plots down here in type two into type one, that's good oil kerogen. And down here, type three, that's usually woody kerogen. But basically this plot, because a lot of these are at higher ROs above 0.7, the spread of data is related to the original kerogen, which would be some of this stuff down here and here, but then even the type two as it cooks through thermal maturation will migrate down here. So some of these down here could be well-cooked type two kerogens. And this is source rock quality in Louisiana by lithophages. It show there's a lithophages control. Because again, I said, I told you there's lithophages one to four that I really like using because they reflect the TLC content. But you can see here, in this um, S1, S2 versus TOC diagram, that type one, which has low TOC, they're poor source rocks, basically. Though they do have uh, 
some of them have a little bit of higher TOC. It's type four, three, and two that make the fair the excellent source rocks. And over here on the um, uh, Van Kevlin plot, you can see the type threes are falling down in here because I think really woody material was what was coming in during those oxidated times. And the type three, type two carrageenan was being eaten up by bacteria. So, but you can see here a lot of the two, three, and four are type two carrageens. Then down here is just the statistical data, type 1.3, type two in Louisiana is 0.7, type three, 1.7, and type four is two. So generally, wherever you plot this out, type one has the least TLC, type three the most. And a little bit, you know, a little bit on the migration in our source, Self-sourcing in Austin, there's a debate, is it Eagleford oil or Austin oil? And this is what I, I proposed this a couple of years ago. And I'll tell you, a, stu uh, a study at the Bureau by Tung Wei Zhang and Sun Su, Su Sun have just said, it's a lot of it, it's Eagleford oil, but it's got a component of Austin. It. They've been doing a bunch of organic analysis. But what I think is happening is the Eagleford gets buried it's going to be become hotter earlier, so it's going to start generating er, earlier. And so Eagleford oil is going to come up to fractures. And also some of the Eagleford here is just going to migrate up in the pore systems of the Austin. But I don't know how far up that can really migrate because the Austin is pretty tight. And so then, so what happens when you start producing the Austin oil, you first take it out of the fractures. And so the early oil, probably out of the Austin, is Eagleford. Then later, after you drop pressure, it'll start sucking the oil out of the framework or the matrix. And this will maybe more Austin oil. And um, Tung Wei at the Bureau now is going to do, working with a company, they're going to do time analysis from the well is first brought on to some, try to do it for some years later to see if the composition of the oil changes. So a lot of Eagleford oil, but also the Austin is self, can be partly self sourcing. And also the Eagleford. Average is somewhere four to seven percent TLC, where the Austin is two percent is good. So I would expect some coming up. Okay, poor networks in here. The Austin chalk is considered a fracture reservoir with some generally late, I think, matrix production contribution. But as one of the slides I showed you earlier, more companies are now concentrating on getting the oil out of the matrix too. If the Austin was a pure fracture reservoir, you'd start. This is one well here in Louisiana. You start off, but then you get a rapid drop, a typical fracture thing. Then it goes at a you know, low die off over a period of time. Here's the Austin oil and gas. It's a, over a couple of years. I mean, this is what, I think eight years. And you can see it's a steady decline going down. That's showing um, not just fracture, but matrix contribution. Okay, and the things in the Austin fractures, you cannot study them in core unless you've got a horizontal core. Then we argue about which fractures in horizontal cores. But this is one of the few really good fractures we've seen in the Austin. They're commonly calcite line. They're very high angle. And so your odds of catching one in a core are very low unless it's a horizontal or deviated well. It's best to study them on outcrop. And this is what Chris Sam is doing. This is one of his outcrops. He takes field trips to with all the Austin fractures on it. So it's best to study these in the L crop. And if you want a lot more on the fractures, you need to get Chris on to come in and give you a talk. Okay, the matrix pores, why important? Storage capacity, pore types. The pore types affects matrix permeability. You interparticle pores enhance perm, whereas interparticle pores commonly are isolated. So they add the storage, but not permeability. Organic matter um, develops pores in the higher RO rocks and it will enhance perm. And porosity and permeability values vary by type of analysis. I think this is gonna be a very important point I'll get to in a minute. Okay, here's a mud rock pore classification I developed for mud rocks and essentially organic matter pores and mainly in bitumen. Down here is interparticle pores. So these are pores between grains or crystals. Um, and then intraparticle pores. These are pores within rocks or within a domain, such as pyrite. You know, some rocks like the Barnett pyrite can be a major contributor to porosity, the low pores between the pyrite crystallites. But looking at these three pore types, 
the Austin sits over here. It's mainly interparticle pores between cochlear fragments and higher RO. You start getting some organic matter pores, and then you also have some interparticle pores. And to, okay, what happens to porosity, the chalk diagenesis is mainly all calcite. So you, when pressure sluice starts taking place, you start getting overgrowth around your grains. Here is a cochlear fragment um, filling with a, uh, a crystal. Down here are cochlear elements. A lot of porosity, starts to overgrowth. Then with advanced cementation, it becomes a pretty tight rock. And here's a, a young chalk. This is going to fairly well cemented one. Here's a cochlith fragment. Here's a crystal in the center. These are coalesced cochlith fragments down here. These are all the elements and you can see the inner particle pores in between. And so some of the examples from the SEM, again, look at the scale. All this dark material in here, these are all interparticle pores. Here's a four amp filled with calcite. This is a very close up two microns. Here's the intercrystalline pores between the cochlear fragments. Then you get these clay flakes, maybe diagenetic, growing in between them. And this will break up the pores more. And over here, again, cochlear fragments with interparticle pores. Then these are distorted clay platelets that give you inter, intraparticle pores. And down here is an inosermis fragment that com commonly contain intraparticle pores. And then organic matter pores, that's where the rocks are above 0.7 RO. And here you see a lot of um, spongy pores in the solid bitumen. These are cochlear fragments here, this is a solid bitumen. These are bubble pores in the solid bitumen. Those are, this is solid bitumen here, cochlear there. These pores, the bubble type ones we call them, form early lower thermal maturation. Then you go over to spongy pores with higher thermal maturation. And these are very common, like this is a major pore network within the Barnett. Then here, you got these big pores, we call them modified mineral pores, and that's a product of bit liquid bitumen coming into a water wet pore. It doesn't replace all the water. And um, so it lines the pore itself, and then the center is still filled with water until we finally ion mill it and it disappears. And a little bit about matrix reservoir quality. Matrix reservoir quality by type of analysis. There's three types of analysis you generally get. Pore plug, GRI crushed rock, or a thing we call modified gas expansion. That is developed by Penn, and I was a co-author with them on that. But the conventional core analyses are not very good, especially the older ones. You can see here all the red dots. This is nano Darcy's now. So here is, um, this is 0.001 millidarcy's right here. You can see you can't, the plugs don't measure beneath this value here. So you end up with higher permeability, permeability values than that should be there. So I don't think many people are doing permeability with these anymore. Um, the GRI crushed rock analysis, they will generally give you higher permeability than actually exists in a rock. That's all the black analyses here. And a good method, but it's a much more expensive and hard method to do is what they call the modified gas expansion analyses. I think these are the most accurate. These are the yellow dots. You can see a nice trend through here and they'll give you some of your lower values down that you're here. But take a look, one more slide on porosity. Here's three wells that we did the modified gas expansion on through here. And here's the plot. This is Daniel Darcy's again, porosity. And you can see such a nice fit through here and it varies by Lithology, the way I've expected to. Here's our type one or the cleaner chalks. The blacks are this more argillaceous TLC rich chalks. And then two and three are in here. So if you're going to do porosity analysis, perm analysis, you should try for a more advanced method. So in conclusion here, um, the producing Austin chalk is a siliciclastic pore to siliciclastic rich. Uh, limestone deposited in deeper water under oxid to anoxid conditions. This is very important for understanding the Austin. Mineralogy follows a mixing trend between calcite and silicate minerals. Um, many samples are relatively organic rich and should contribute to sourcing of the Austin. Pore types are predominantly interparticle pore between cochlith fragments. And this is important. Austin, from my experience so far, Austin chalk has low reservoir quality generally less than 10% in a producing trend. And 
not on the outcrops, that's so we can get real high, but less than 10% and generally less than 8%. And permeability is generally less than 0.002 millidarcies, and this would still be pretty good. An important thing to remember, porosity and permeability values depend upon methods of analysis. Okay, I went a little bit longer than I want it. Any questions? Thank you for that, Bob. <clears throat> no problem at all. So for everyone uh, asking questions, I, I see some people submitted through chat. Uh, the best way is also to submit through the question and answer tab, which is right next to chat. Uh, so we can go ahead and get those submitted now and we'll start going through the questions. I can see some coming in already. Uh, I'll ask the first one, uh, Bob. This one is, um, any thoughts on the fracture patterns in Austin chalk and how do they change along the Austin trends? Okay, it's a great question for Chris. Um, I'm sorry. As I said, in this study, also, Chris is doing the uh, fracture pattern analysis. That's not my part. I have enough to do with the uh, basic rocks. So I can't answer that for you. Okay, no problem. So uh, that's a question you said for Chris? <laughs> yes, it is. All right, <clears throat> okay. Um, the next question is, uh, do you have an estimate of the porosity related to open fractures versus matrix? Well, if you got, I mean, this is just a age old question, what kind of fracture porosity do you have in any rock? And it's generally what, 2% or less. Mm -hmm. And what, what's amazing, what I see, and I don't know how to explain this yet, the fractures that I see in core, they generally, they generally are calcite cemented, sometimes they have a little bit of a void space left. And we have one horizontal core from the Pearsall Field in Frio County, Texas. And that horizontal core, uh, it's a, quite a long core, I forget how many hundreds of feet. But there it's hard to tell what is a really open fracture or not. And again, you don't see like good calcite cemented with big holes in it like that. All how right. about some right. questions? How about some questions based about rocks and not fractures? <laughs> Remember, people well, are going for the port, the the uh, matrix porosity now too. Correct. Well, uh, one one question uh, I see here is, uh, when are clay particles good? Clay particles? Yeah. Okay. I prefer no clay, but in uh, lithophases four, uh, sometimes some of your a good portion of your porosity are bent or compacted clay platelets. Remember the clay platelets are made of sheets of, of, of a clay. And if you bend them, they'll pop and you get intraparticle pores in them. They're really not good pore types, but I don't want to discount um, what porosity they do contribute. But is it, again, 90, 5% of your porosity in any of these rocks are going to be related to the inter-particle port between calculus fragments. Got it. <clears throat> okay. uh, one question I have here is, uh, any ideas on water cut? You know, that's a, Chris Dom just gave a, a talk at the Super Basin Conference where he, he talked about the Austin and one of, his slides was very much that one of the challenging things in Austin is the water cut. And it seems, as, as he, I think what he pointed out, as you go in front of the Old Stewart City Reef area, you get a lower water cut than up there. But water cut, I don't think it's just coming, okay. My estimation is it's not coming out of the matrix itself, it's probably coming up fractures. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing these hydro fracking now, you probably gotta watch what's happening below. What's below, though, it should be the Eagleford or Tuscaloosa. So that's the same type of rock. Got it. Okay. Well, thanks for, thanks for that, that answer, Bob. Uh, another question we got here is, could the production decline of legacy horizontal wells be used to map out effective porosity variations in the trend? Um, and also just to thank you for the talk. Uh, thanks for the very comprehensive and detailed update. You know, that's a good question, but again, I got to pass on that. We have two people in our group now, Robin, uh, they're doing geomodeling, and a guy, Frank Mayo, is looking at questions just like you, 
that's being asked there. And that has just got started in the last few months, and I don't know his results. Got it. We got we got tons Again, of questions coming in. <laughs> okay. Here's a question. I can say on, as long um, as you want. But yeah, give me one question. on geology. <laughs> I got one right here. Uh, some <laughs> of the wells in Karn's tr trough area have very high matrix porosities ranging between 10 and 15 percent. These wells are usually close to major faults within half a mile or less. Can you provide your thoughts on this phenomenon? Some of these wells have been prolific producers. Yeah, I know it. And I have a problem. If you could pro provide me of a core within the trough, I could give someone a good answer. Uh, I could, you know, that's a hard, because I've not seen a core. I cannot answer some questions without rock data. But all I can think of is there could be a slight chance of some enhancement of porosity along the faults by fluids coming up the faults. I've not seen that in any of the other cores though. Um, and I would also like to know, okay, I'd I really can't answer that question. If I got some core plugs from a well with 15% porosity and quote higher permeabilities, I could run this modified gas expansion analysis on it and then tell people, is this just a method of analysis you're using or is it a real rock enhancement? But if they get better production, then I'm not going to argue with it. Right, right. Um, so how, how does the reservoir differ between Pearsall and Giddings fields? If you could summarize, summarize that. <laughs> You're asking... Um, I don't know. I'm not, in, okay, I'll be honest with you. I'm not into the production part. I'm interested in getting people knowledge of the reservoir matrix and Chris the faults so that you all, the oil company types, can make these decisions. But now that we're doing geo modeling, within the next year, we should have um, a, lo a lot more thoughts on that. But I, I don't look at that type of um, comparisons right now. Right. Um... No, I appreciate that. Uh, so, you know, one of the questions I have here is, uh, how how does how do you get access to this database? This uh, okay, that's them. Well, this this database is part of our RCRO consortium. It's a proprietary database. Um, people that use the database need to join the consortium, and we uh, because about right now this year we have about twenty four people groups that are into the consortium and they can access the database. But what I'm doing in these talks, I'm showing you derivatives of the database, the summary data. So I basically say people, we encourage anyone working in Austin Jacques to join our consortium. You know, even if it's for one year, you can get all this data. And like I showed, there's at least $2 million worth of hard data there. And I don't know if I'm allowed to advertise here or not, so I won't. Got it. Um, I'm, I imagine this question may not be in your alley, but I'll ask it anyways, because we only have a few left. <laughs> Do you think there is economic potential in refracking these older legacy wells that were simply targeting fractures? You know, if, yes. If you go into, I think if you go into the lower Austin and do a horizontal well and do the hydrofrac, you'll be um, pulling more on the, the poor net matrix, poor network. So, because again, I can't see a, a, a vertical well with the fractures draining a lot of, of the uh, matrix poor network, but a horizontal well, just like, you know, the Barnett or Eagleford or anything else can do mm -hmm. it. Okay. I'd be curious if companies are going back and doing that, I mean, going back into the old vertical wells and doing horizontal hydrofrac. Hmm. That's a good idea. Um, the next one is, how does compressive strength vary between lithofacies? Oh, okay. I, lithofacies one and two, that's the more calcite, well, the, um, the bioturbated one and all that, that's uh, much higher much higher than uh, lithophases three and four. That's, like I said, I probably should add a slide. We have one slide that does show that. 
but I didn't have it in this talk. Okay. Well, you know, uh, appreciate your time, Bob, on, on everything you've done. I, I think uh, we're pretty much to the end of the questions. Uh, so I just wanted to give the opportunity for anybody still here, since we're running out of time, uh, that uh, free, to, free to go whenever you'd like. Uh, so we have some thanks for your talk. And uh, I think one last question is, a, do you have a, an idea for the best reservoir zone from what you've seen on all these cores? Is there any, or, or maybe best combination of lithophases? You know, from doing the geology itself, looking where, I would have thought the upper part would be better, but it's the lower part that, you know, most people in the last several years have been going for. And it may be more important having the high TLC, because again, uh, a, shale, a shale reservoir or mudrock reservoir has to be self-sourcing to some extent. And um, so I think the lower part that has all this high TLC, higher TLC rock is the better one. Okay. But then there's another thing though, something that people need to consider if they're really worrying about fractures, how does this cyclicity, which I'm showing you that can be on the inch to foot scale of um, rocks with very different iron confining strength, um, analyses, how, how are they going to frack differently? Mm -hmm. Like Chris thinks you're going to frack the carbonate rich part and not do very well possibly with the, um, what I call lithophases four. Then just like in Eagleford, people worry about the ash, the volcanic ash beds that you can frack and then those ash beds, the propent will sink into them. I've not heard anyone talk about this for the Austin, these more TLC argillaceous rich beds, will there be any propent, you know, not, you know, um, problems of it sinking into the um, bedding into the softer rocks. Okay. And uh, the final question. So thank you all for all the questions you submitted. And after this, we'll go ahead and close up from, I'm sure everybody's got things they got to run and do on a busy Wednesday. But uh, in the past, rumors have it that the Austin chalk would imbibe fluids and come back to life. Question mark. This, I don't know that story. Okay. All right. Got hey, it. Let, let me find, say all my questions are more, which I should know. You're all production. You're all exploration and production is. I'm looking at the Austin, trying to characterize it geologically, not how to produce it. That's your problem. But you make more money for than I do just characterizing <laughs> rocks. So I apologize not having all those good answers, but. Someone should have asked me more about volcanic quartz or glauconite or something. But okay, <laughs> thank you. I, I appreciate having the opportunity. No, not at all. No, we appreciate uh, we appreciate you coming in and giving a talk, Bob. Uh, we'll definitely be okay. reaching out to you in the future. So with that, thank you all, everyone, for, for joining the event. I'm going to go ahead and close this up and, and stay tuned and okay. check out uh, future events coming to the HGS. Take care, everyone. Bye.